Rick and I playing by. I am Myra Block Kaiser, and on behalf of the board of directors of 108 Contemporary, I'm thrilled that so many of you came today for this very special artist talk by Joyce Scott. But before I turn the program over to Jeff Martin, who is kind enough to introduce her today, I want to say a huge thank you to All Souls Unitarian Church, all the ministers and all the staff who are hosting us today, but more than that, who have been such willing and enthusiastic partners setting this up and helping our program for the exhibition. The exhibition runs through September 24th, and Sonia Clark will be here to help close the show, and she will be giving her own artist talk on September 23rd. So I know you want to mark your calendars and come and listen to what she has to say about her work as well. On our website, we have listings of other programming events for the show. So we hope you'll come often and bring friends and um, just be a part of our exhibition. One more thing to tell you about today is that the Tulsa Girls Art School, TGAS, um, has an exhibition upstairs that's opening today at 3 o'clock, I believe, this afternoon. So don't forget to go and see that as well. So without any further ado, Jeff. I've had the privilege to work at Philbrook Museum across the street for the better part of the last 10 years, and that's where I first encountered Joyce's work, because we have it in our permanent collection. We're one of many uh, museums around the country, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art and, and other great institutions that, that hold Joyce's work in our permanent collection. And it was something that struck me from the moment, the moment that I first saw it. Um, but I'm not going to attempt to try to describe Joyce's work, especially while she's sitting here right next to me. Because um, I know she could do much better at that herself. But uh, there's this great interview from like the early 1960s with Sam Cooke. And he's talking to this radio DJ, and the DJ is on a, kind of an R&B and soul station. And the DJ asks Sam Cooke to describe what soul is. And Sam Cooke doesn't say anything. He just goes straight into this about eight bars of humming. And when he's done with the eight bars of humming, you kind of get what soul is, right? He didn't try to describe it, he didn't try to tell you what it is, because in some ways you can't tell people what things like that are. But you understood the minute that he was done. And I think Joyce is gonna uh, give us a, a hint of what that is about her work today. Um, like I said, you're probably wondering what a nerdy book guy like me is doing up here, introducing a, a fine artist, a visual artist, and someone who is one was popular. Popular, yes. She was wondering, and it was one, someone who's popularly, you know, uh, known as a MacArthur genius, having won the uh, 2016 MacArthur uh, grant. Yes, that's a huge. I thought the same thing too. I was like, why are they asking me to do this? But the more I thought about it, I started to make sense, and it's because I, I always tell people what I do is not about books or reading. It's really about ideas and stories. And even in my capacity at the museum, what we do is not necessarily about the paintings on the wall or the sculptures. It's about the ideas within them, the stories they tell, all of those different things. Um, it's about dialogue, and it's about trying to understand a world that often makes that task quite difficult. And Joyce Scott, as far as I can tell, is all about stories and ideas. Stories about America, stories we often turn away from, stories that attempt to capture the African-American experience from all sides. The fact that she's able to do this with glass and beads and various other inanimate objects speaks to that genius, those smart people at MacArthur wisely noticed. And growing up here in Tulsa, oblivious for too many years to the history of this place in terms of our relationship to race, um, I never noticed as a kid how segregated this city really was and still remains so to this day, unfortunately. Um, when I was 12 years old, for reasons that I still can't explain, I asked my mom to go take me and see Spike Lee's movie, Malcolm X. It was playing at the now long gone South Road Cinema, a two, a two screen kind of old school movie palace. Um, and I'm pretty sure the other film playing there was Pure Country with George Strait. Okay? Kind of a 
purple rain for country people. Um, <laughs> when my mom pulled up and she dropped me off in front, there were two very different crowds, all the white people going in one direction and all the African American people going in another direction. And I'm sure that I stuck out. There were these two parallel rivers of cowboy hats and X hats going in two different directions. But that film kind of changed me. It added a ring to my tree of culture inside of me. It made me start thinking about things differently. Um, I went the next week to the school library and picked up Malcolm X's autobiography that he wrote with Alex Haley. And if you haven't read it, it's another thing that really changed my life. It made me start thinking even as a kid about race and equality and issues that I'd never thought about before. All of this is to say that my journey towards thinking about big things didn't come in the classroom or at the dining, in the dining room. It came through art, through books, through films, through seeing things. The choices that Joyce Scott makes and the work she makes have this same impact. When I first saw Joyce speak a few years ago, um, I thought that the presentation would be as heavy as the subject matter. But she takes on these topics with an amazing amount of humor and wit and endless charisma, as you've seen already today. In 2017, I hope there are more of these conversations happening in the classrooms and the dining rooms throughout this country. I hope, but I don't know for certain. You've all probably heard the idea that if a great work of art had never existed, the world wouldn't miss it. But now that it does, we can't imagine the world without it. That's how you know greatness. And I can't imagine a world without Joyce Scott.
things. You may dim the lights a bit more, thank you, though. My name is Joyce Shea Scott, and I'm one of those kids carrying on the Scott Colwell tradition of, of the visual and performing arts. I will start by showing you pictures of my parents, my mother, Elizabeth Caldwell Talford Scott, and my father, Charlie Scott, Jr. Now, at their dinner table in Durham, North Carolina, it was Charlie Scott, Sr., Charlie Scott, Jr., and his brother's name was Charles. I do not see the logic in that, <laughs> but I think it explains a lot about me and my family. My parents would be really angry with me if I did not take this opportunity to thank 108 Contemporary and All Souls for having me here today. I just came from lunch. I saw Leo walk in, and boy, did I learn a lot. You know, when you're on the road, you can spend a lot of time in hotel rooms, you can be drinking really bad beer, or if you're like me, watching Game of Thrones over <laughs> and over again, and working on your computer. Or you can have right-thinking people who introduce you to the brainiacs in their, their community, and that's what happened to me today, so thank you. My parents were, were solid working class people and the greatness in them coalesced in me. These are my father's parents, Charlie Scott Sr. and Mamie Scott. They lived in Bright Leaf, Durham, North Carolina. They were tobacco uh, plantation people. When I asked my father if they made art, my father, who was, and our last name is Scott for a real reason, he was one of those guys who would take a quarter, squeeze it, and it would become a dollar and a half, and he'd never share it. <laughs> well, my father said, uh, look at here, he, uh, is you talking about, I don't know about no art, but they, he would call the canoe when they went out to fish and have all kinds of designs on it. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> yes, Dad. And his wife, Mamie, was a quilt maker. Now I can hear her right now. <laughs> Humming the blues when she was a quilter. She made fancy and utilitarian quilts. But she also had that improvisational beam inside of her glowing. So she might take a quilt like the one you see on the right hand side. One that might be like the log cabin or the geese and break them up. You can hear her. Skeetit, bitty, bop, bop scatting this away. And when people look at this work, I understand. They're thinking that's African-American work. Like one ethnic group can have only one way of seeing things, one vision. But I, I understand they're talking about maybe like strip weaving, the ubiquitous fabric, the kenti cloth that comes from Ghana. But those are improvisational uh, forms of artwork. When that guy is weaving, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's coming up with something different and unique with each row and with my grandmama's same with each stitch. Now my mother's family, the Caldwells, another good Scottish name, from Blackstalks, which is outside of Chester, South Carolina. I've attempted to find it on the map. It does not exist. Were sharecroppers and they for share popping cat and along with vegetables, excuse me. I swallowed a lot of tea so that I would have a silken voice for you. And now it's returning to you. They lived supposedly on the land that was probably the land that their ancestors share crop. My grandmom had 14 children, 12 lived. They lived in a small cabin, the bathroom, and probably kitchen were on the outside, the outhouse when I say bathroom. And my grandfather, Samuel Caldwell, had as many jobs as he had children. Remember, 14 children. So he used to raise horses. He was a sharecropper. He was a blacksmith and a potter. 
He used to work on the railroad. In fact, the story is that he'd be coming down the road with 14 pairs of shoes on, uh, wrapped around his shoulders, and pockets filled with candy. And the kids would take off, running toward him, going through his pockets, and you didn't want to be the last person to get the shoes, because you got them whether they fit or not. <laughs> he was also a quilter. That image is of his quilt. And I show that to you because it directly relates to this kind of afro symmetry and the idea that the corners don't have to match exactly. And you know, when he wanted to dye fabric, he couldn't go to the art store. He had to wade in the water, wade in the water, children, and get some yellow ochre clay and bile it, as we would say in the South, with fabric. And quilts didn't dye. So if a quilt was like tattered and torn, you just put a new cover on the top, and that's what he did. And I want you to know that there were male quilters. And this is his wife, my grandma. I'm named after her, Joyce Jane, Mary Jane. She's the woman who had the 14 children, so she wasn't out there picking cotton very much. <laughs> she was being a housewife or a cabin wife, and she also was a quilt maker. Now she made fancy quilts, but they made a lot of utilitarian quilts because they were cheaper than blankets. They also made utilitarian quilts because many times they'd go to the mills that took the cotton they uh, harvested and barred it back from the fabric made from the very cotton. Many times they'd also keep the short hairs of cotton, the cotton that's very, very difficult to spin, and they would comb it and cart it and ply it, and they'd make little booties and sandals out of it. Because those shoes that I talked about were your fancy shoes, so you wore those to Sunday church maybe or a wedding, but not every day. Now when you look at this quilt, it really talks about something I believe. That quilt making for many people, but since I'm African American, I'm gonna talk about were history keepers. They were diaries for preliterate people. You know, there's always somebody who went to school in the family, and they always write everything in the family Bible, but how do you tell those kind of family stories? You get people like me, who's full of themselves, who's just coming back from Hong Kong or something, and goes to visit somebody. Hello, everyone, how are you? I'm Dave. And there's, uh, I don't care who you are, everybody has an aunt like her. Whether her name is Juanita, Raquel, Beulah, Gingwa Shu. This is this aunt. Yeah, what you doing? Come on over here, give me a big slug and how you doing, baby. Come on and sit right here. Should I? There's something that's censored and so on. I love it because the geezer's in here like me, so you know that was Betty Davis. That's it. And, okay, maybe you did. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you, there's this quilt, and it's old, and it's got stains, and you're not sure whether you should sit on it, but, but this auntie's like this. Are you kidding? That's not a stain, that's Uncle Benny's knee print. You didn't know Uncle Benny? No, I, I've been on the continent. Well, Uncle Benny was, now see, this quilt is so old. In the Depression, we had victory gardens. He was always trying to grow the sweetest tomatoes, but he couldn't. He got the really sour tomatoes, and we had so much cha-cha pickle. Cha-cha in South Carolina. Chow-chow everywhere else. <laughs> so he had so much cha-cha pickle, and this is one of his shirt, and you did, and his daughter's a slut, you know. And did you? <laughs> so just from that quilt alone, you get a whole bunch of family history. People wouldn't throw away their clothing, because that was some kind of special piece from Graham's or a handkerchief or something like that. And the stain wasn't a stain. It was some kind of memory that somebody left just for you. So these are pre-literate people making books. And so when my mom told me that I destroyed this quilt because she brought it with her from South Carolina. She's one of the Africans, and so is my father, African Americans, who came north during that great migration. The first time I heard that, I thought they were talking about buffalo. I mean, what are they talking about? But they were talking about the African Americans who left the South. 
to find a better life and to get away from people who are trying to hang them. So this was a utilitarian quilt with great swaths of fabric, recycled fabric. And my mom said I helped to tear it up. So, so she really said these words to me. If you love it, you ought to write on it, meaning I should stitch it. You ought to put a new page on the book, meaning a new quilt top. And then we get to the love of my life. I hope all of you have a mom who was the best person on the earth, because she was mine. Elizabeth Caldwell Talford Scott was born in 1916, a year before the beginning, the established beginning of the First World War. And she died five years ago at the age of 95. She was a nationally known quilt maker. Now, that cabin I told you about that had 16 people in it was really small. They didn't have a lot of room for lots of stuff. I don't really know how the kids slept in there. But when they had a quilting frame, they would have it hoisted, hoisted to the top, and then they would lower it. And then they'd sit around with the quilt, and my mom said the kids would get under the quilt, and that's where they made their samplers. And they were there also in case you dropped the needle too low and they'd send it back. <laughs> and they got to hear all those family stories. My joke was always, I hope there wasn't a lot of beans going on. Thank you for laughing. It's very good job. Well, this quote you're looking at is called the 50-year quote, because she started it in her youth. And as she traveled and went through more fabric, more clothing, she cut it up and added to the quilt, and she actually used it as a primer for me, because I learned how to quilt on it. The quilt on the left is owned by the Delaware Museum. It's called Grandfather's Cabin, that kind of... Uh, plastic house shape is the cabin. And it's one of those autobiographical quilts. It talks about the insects and the starry nights and, and the water. On the bottom there are these squiggly lines and they're snakes. My mom said that once a year, a snake would come to the cabin door and knock. <laughs> and her father would kick the door open and boom! He'd shoot off his shotgun and there'd be nothing left but an old snake skin. <laughs> so you know, those kind of stories is what give you those songs. Yeah, there was once a snake skin, I died, and there was once a gun. You know, all those old songs that you do. <laughs> and the piece on the right is one of her prayer shawls. Prayer cloths, prayer shawls. You would put them on the back of a chair and nestle into them when you weren't doing well, and you feel better. When she was ill and hospitalized, I used to take her favorite one and put it on her tummy. Now my mom was not someone who believed that you were the boss of her. I have taken that as my mantle as well. <laughs> so when people say, well wait a second, how is that a quilt? It's got buttons and rocks and beads and probably some kind of strange elixir on it. And she'd say that these are magic. But not the kind of magic we think about with the guy with the hat or the person who cuts himself up and gets in a box all night. Yeah, that sounds like actually an interesting party, doesn't it? <laughs> I know we're in church, but don't you be sitting like you acting like you ain't never done that. I see a couple of people here. Okay. She was talking about a kind of alchemy. The strength of prayer and positive thought and of submission. A little heavy handed with this. And then came I, the illustrious Joyce J. Scott. I was my mother's only child. My father, Charlie Scott Jr., or as I call him, Casanova Scott, has four other children. So I am blessed to have an older brother or sister and a younger brother or sister. My older sister, Lois, lives in Baltimore, and we see each other every once in a while, and my older brother, Coy Lee, lives in Durham, uh, North Carolina still, and uh, he called me not so long ago. Actually, I called him. No, he called me because he never calls me. And he says, uh, look, Joyce, my wife woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. You was on some TV show cooking. You still doing that shit? <laughs> you all, you still? I'm like, yeah, and like, uh, I was on TV, so that should tell you that I'm 
doing okay. I mean, it wasn't the cops I was cooking. And I looked fabulous. I looked like this kind of nouveau mammy. I know you're going to be upset by me saying this because I had on an apron and I had on a schmata and I had the best makeup person. So I was cooking, but okay. My, I have a younger brother and sister who live in Maryland. But I was raised as his only child. I was a latchkey kid. Uh, for a long time, we lived in an apartment on the second floor, one block away from my elementary school. And Miss Agnes and her husband on the first floor would make sure that I got up into the apartment, I'd do my homework, I'd call my mom, I'd eat my snack, and then I'd make art. And because I had some very close friends who are still my friends, mom would let them come. And we'd do that because we had a TV, which was the size of a, an envelope, I think, as I remember it. You know what, I, later I found out about my mom. She was feeding those kids with her, her dinner. And she was working in people's homes, so she would eat so that they could. So if they went home and didn't have enough food, they'd be taken care of my house. She instilled that in me, the love of others, and the desire to care for others. Well, I was raised by a village. When I say I walked a block away to the elementary school, and most of the time I got into my classes, I was a fashionable dresser way back then which meant that there were things dripping off of me. And the principal was always at the front door and sometimes I was sent home. If she couldn't get it out of my hair and off me, I had to go home and change. In fact, once I got past her, I'd sewn a hula hoop into the hem of my skirt. <laughs> I got to my class, Mr. Perry, it would have to be a male. And you know, when you sit down with a hula hoop, if you do this, you can see your panties in the back and if you do that, you see your panties. I went home. My mother was waiting for me. She knew. Can I tell you one more story about my youth? I think it will give you some more insight of me. Two more stories, but one will go. My father worked at Bethlehem Steel. He never would lose weight. Work, he always would work overtime. He was one of those real hard workers. And Mr. Perry said he would like to see me, him, me, somebody in the family. My mom said, I'm not missing class. I do all of the PTA meetings. I'm not missing work. You go. My father went. This for me, because I love my father unconditionally, even though my dad would look at me like, I'm not sure about you. <laughs> and I'm walking to school with my dad, and we sit down and talk to Mr. Perry, and he is crestfallen because it, it's two men talking about me. And this is what the story was. My mother had brought me a training bra. I'm sure I badgered her to death. It was probably the fifth or sixth grade. And I didn't have much to put in it. So if I was walking to school and I needed some help, I'd shove it in my bra. My lunch, a box, probably a pencil sticking out of bed. And Mr. Perry was just, he was, you know, lightning struck by this. So he wanted to talk to my mom about it, but there's my dad. So these two men are discussing my bra in the fifth grade, sixth grade, probably. My father, who was lighter skinned than I, turned up a kind of aubergine. <laughs> And you know, they're asking me about it, and I thought, I, I, it was practical. I thought it was the thing you would do. So you wouldn't drop nothing or break nothing. And they're like, my father told my mother he was never going back to that story. <laughs> and the other story, which was told to me by my godparents, who also were the preachers in our Pentecostal apostolic church, and my godfather used to preach with me, in his arms when I got obstreperous, like you know, in the congregation. You know those people, you all have children. He preached with me. They said to me, well, we know why you are as you are. I'm like, what does that mean? You used to do street ministry with us. You were, can you even believe this? 
So I was really young. I didn't remember it. They said you used to play the used to uh, play the tambourine and sing, Love Lift Me. And we got a lot more money when you did it. <laughs> so those stories should inform you about why I am the person I am today. My senior high school teacher, Olin Yoder, helped me get a scholarship at the Maryland Institute of Art, which is one of the top four art uh, schools today. But at that time, it was a much smaller place, but still out of my range, meaning monetarily. When I went there, I was sure I was going to be a painter. My freshman year, they told me to stop painting for the betterment of myself and the entire human race. <laughs> they actually said that to me. And later on, they had to do a little fete for me, a small party with over 100 people, because I am a MacArthur Fellow. And I'm like this. <laughs> well, you know, it turned out to be quite a positive thing, because I always thought I would teach in some way, but I got my undergraduate degree in education. And in education, I did everything that my mom taught me because you had to know everything, because they weren't really, you know, our teachers had to do everything. One of the things I excelled at was stitchery, the kind of thing that my mom did. But I knew that I would be a 700 pound alcoholic if I actually taught in the public school system. <laughs> so I did what anybody would do, from an art school it is, in 1970, I ran off to Mexico with my friends to find myself and be a hippie. There I was lucky enough to get a scholarship at the Instituto Allende, and I got my uh, master's degree in crafts. That started my sojourn around the world. One place I went was to the San Blas Islands off the coast of Panama. There's a complex around 300 islands. Some are the size of this room that have just fresh water or one family on it. Some are much larger. I was on one of the much larger islands. This was before they were littered with tourists, and it was an amazing thing to be able to do that. See, the year I was in Mexico was a year that I was in a country of brown people everywhere. Brown people who were poor, brown people who were governors, but I mean, it was the whole country, not just my neighborhood. And I was becoming more and more enlightened about, enlightened about what the world means ethnically. So I went to this island, and this is Mola work. Mola really is the name of the blouse, but we call it reverse applique. Instead of just sewing things down, you make layers of fabric and cut through the, each layer after you stitch the one before. And they looked at my work and they laughed at me and I laughed at them. I, with my nose, I'm international, so I was a big Luna. They are called the second shortest people in the world after the big name. But that was one of those steps where I had this adventure. And you know what I was doing? My mom was on that whew, migration to the north and she'd given me this ability to be this migration around the world. She did it to have her freedom and to find herself, and, and I did it for me. I was a weaver for years. But you know, warping a loom or warping anything, it, this is like the part that you don't like. You understand why slavery existed. So slaves could do it, because this is not something that I would do every day. It's true, you think of all the jobs that you like, oh, that's really horrible, oh, that's right, they have slaves doing I tried for years to keep weaving, but then I realized it wasn't only the weaving, it was that I was really into translucency. Now, you remember, I'm still a hippie, right? So I wanted like to transluse, to go through, and with fiber, it either is absorbed or bounces off the surface. I'm sorry, I have very, obviously, thick thumbs. Now you can tell these are old slides because I only have one chin. <laughs> and that hairstyle is back again. That's how old they are. I'd gone to the Haystack Mountain School of Crafts in Deer Isle, Maine 
for an African and African American study session. And that was in the early 70s. In 1976, I went back for the bicentennial year. There were many Native Americans who were teachers then. Some were boycotting the idea of the bicentennial, others were talking about it differently. And I met a woman from Oklahoma who I hoped might be here today, because she was here two years ago when I did a talk at the Philbrook, who taught me the peyote stitch. And trust me, I didn't come up with it or get it from a book. I met someone who shared that to me. And in sharing that with me, she actually helped me on that next step of elevation in my life because I'd always sewn beads into fabric the way my mom taught me to. And then when you go to the Girl Scouts or some club, they, they pull out the classic American Indian room. It's great to work on, but you always have warp threads to deal with. But the peyote stitch is the needle thread and bead. And you can be as improvisational as you wish. Serpentine, sculptural, it's all your strength all your knowledge. And that's what my mom always told me, make a way where there is no way. Make something out of nothing. I, when I told you that her side of the family did everything, they were potters. They didn't have a pot, they couldn't afford to go out and buy it. They dig a hole in the ground, line it with stones, start a fire. The pinch pots, the coil pots they made, went in there and they made a, had low fire pottery. Well, low fire pottery it breaks easily and many times it is not water worthy, so they would cover it with pitch, put designs in the pitch. I was at the museum two days ago talking to Catherine. She said, oh, we have pitch pots here because they were not watertight. So it's not just my family telling me this. This was an accepted way of working with clay. And that's how they did it, and they passed that on to me. So these pieces were when I was just starting to do the peyote stitch, and you could tell because they have everything, including the kitchen sink. <laughs> I love them because they are so sculptural. I was always like a mad scientist inventor in the sense that if you already do that, I'm gonna push you farther. I always am not satisfied. I'm like a little icky person who's in the studio thinking, I can't just do this, I have to do something else. But every time I made a uh, masterpiece. Like this, I had to reinvent the wheel because I wasn't mastering the technique of beading. So I took all of these extraneous materials out and I just learned how to bead. I wanted to be able to do flat beading. I wanted to be able to do narrative beading, dimensional work, realistic work. The piece on the left is called um, Chalk Lines. That little girl was shot, she's killed in her smiley face dress. The woman found her teddy bear and the cops came and drew chalk lines around all the evidence. The other Spanish saints, I wanted to be able to write in the air so I'm doing these lines of stitchery, of peyote stitch, but I just don't want them to be a straight bar. I want to make them look as if I were hand drawing. The piece on the left is a necklace that I sent to uh, Madame Obama. Because I kept seeing her on TV, and she always had these big chunks of plastic around her neck. <laughs> they were fabulous. They're laughing because they know what I mean. They're fabulous. And you know, um, alternative materials, especially. For 108, you've got jewelry made out of chunks of plastic and probably toenails and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> but she's the first lady, and she kept wearing these big, chunky plastic necklaces. And I thought, I'm going to send her something with a line. So I did. I had a friend who was in politics to, to get it into the White House to her without my having to go through, you know, everything. And my firstborn child. And I never saw her in it. A year later, I hadn't ever seen her. You know, I don't see everything, but maybe in the newspaper. And I thought, there's somebody in that kitchen cooking in this thing. <laughs> so I started talking to my friend, and just before we really made a push, I got a very nice letter from her. I know it was a stock letter, but it did say, and I hope to hear from you again, which I thought 
was a veiled attempt to get a pair of matching earrings. <laughs> she don't want to go, she won't talk to me about that. For all of you young people in there, in the audience, chutzpah made me do that. It was like, I know the way she looks. I know I like that. I personally can make a change, and I try. Talking about making a change, the lavender piece on the right is a very important necklace to me. And I shall only sell it to an institution that shall show it or to a buyer who will eventually put it into an institution. And I say that to you because I don't know if you've noticed this. Shut up, Leo. But I have a really, really big personality. And that doesn't always serve you well when you're going into the studio. So I attempt to submit. I stop being Joyce, I turn on the TV, and I let the materials and the techniques tell me what to do. I realized that I'd never made a necklace like this before, ever. The back is as good as the front. You can't really see that there are photographs that are under these cabochons of glass. And there are nuggets of amethyst within them. And that happened because I believe that the wisdom came through my submitting to everything, not being the boss. So I'm always saying to younger artists or people who are young and want to talk about that road ahead of them, that that's very important, to be able to throttle your ego and just do the work. Let's be in another wig, curly. I look good in it, but it's not the same color. This is a piece that is pictorial. It's a large piece, and you can see I'm doing sculptural, uh, work, flat work, uh, narrative work. Now we're getting to my sculpture. Uh, there's a man here who has a piece of sculpture of mine called the birthing chair. Am I right? Yes. So I made a series of those with different names. And it was one of my first forays into doing large beaded pieces and large beaded figures. My mom told me, because she took care of so many kids, that she loved them, and I'm talking about white kids, but it was most hurtful to her when one of them would call her a nigger. Now, these are kids. They didn't go to a job. They weren't doing their graduate studies. These were kids, so where would they hear those words? From their family. So I started a, a series called Nanny Now, Nigger Later. And these are some of the later pieces from that series. The piece on the left is a woman holding an ambrotype, which is an old, old photographic technique where the image is on glass of a white man. She, that's her husband. And the little person sneaking from behind her apron is their child. The other piece, which was just broken, in Seattle, but I shall repair it. I think this one is called Family Matters. This nanny is not silver to him. She's platinum. She is everything to him, except the wet nurse. And he's growing up, and he has this horrible dilemma about who she must become to him as he realizes she's not just Bessie, she's black Bessie. She's not just that person who used to rock me to sleep at night. She's the person I may not be able to hold hands or smile with when I see her on the street. She may call me Joey now, but pretty soon I'm gonna be Mr. Joey to her. And she's adult, but she's gonna remain Bessie. That's quite a dilemma to put on, on a child, especially with someone that they love. I do work also that's just about beauty and that tests me as an artist. So this one is about narcissus and my goal in this was to fuse my beadwork 
into glass. Once again, translucency, transparency. This is a very old technique, but I'm helping to change it because I'm the bead worker. So it's not just a, a belt or a pin that someone has found. I'm actually making the figures that are in my glass. I had a retrospective at the Baltimore Museum of Art in the year 2000. And from that retrospective, and here's the thing now, I'm truly a Baltimore girl. The Cone Sisters, the Cone Collection, I call them the Cone Heads. There's a whole area in the museum and they were redoing it. So when I had my retrospective, they gave me almost the entire museum. I had three installations and they, they commissioned a performance and a lot of work. Well, when that exhibition came down, it traveled for two years. And one of the places it went to was the Tacoma Glass Museum. And there, if you have an exhibition, you also get a residency. And I worked with their in-house glass people. Now, this for me is pretty amazing. Because you remember, my, I'm a roundaway girl from Baltimore who was raised across the street from the projects, whose parents were share property members there. And my artwork is not only being celebrated and accepted, but it's also a tool that allows me to grow as an artist because I get to do residencies. Well, I did this there. And you have to see how I'm talking to you. There's an audience while you're working and you get to talk to the audience and I was really good. I cuss very little, as I'm doing today, which I don't think is fair, but I'm still trying to be a good person. <laughs> and this is one of the pieces I made there. I started it there, it's around 28 inches tall. I had to put holes in it, and I went home and I added beadwork to it and photography. I'm someone who's in that school of stretching glass from glass only or glass metal to glass and other materials like beads. Next. I was asked to work at um, RISD, Rhode Island School of Design. I was coming up to do crits with uh, jewelers. And I asked them how much, and they told me, and I said, no. I know you really want me, so do this. Give me a day in the glass studio with students, and pay for the shipping, and I'll do it. And they did. And this is some of the artwork that came out of that. So not only did I get to do artwork there, but the students got to see someone who was not a glass artist do something different. Now that's important because, remember, we're all taught by the same people, or the next generation. So to have somebody come in who is loopy as I am, they get to play differently with glass. The piece on the right that has that kind of smudged blue figure, that's my beadwork that's been fused into the glass. And once again, I'll have them place holes and do sculptural stuff that allows me to come back later and add beadwork to it. There's one piece in this show at 108 that's in this series. I try not to only look at other people's tragedies or heinous behavior by other ethnic groups and not talk about myself, my group. Albinos in certain parts of Africa are seen as exotic animals or humans that can be sacrificed for some other good. You might be coming home from work and you'll be waylaid on the road, your arms will be cut off and you'll be cast aside. If you have an infant, somebody might break into your home and take your infant. And these parts are used because they're special and they bring power to someone else. But the people who do this are their community members, sometimes relatives. Sometimes people are set up Come on, Jim, we'll go over here and have a drink. And when he's going there, he's, he's attacked by people who he knows. So this is a flayed African, his face and his genitals. And they fit in your hand like this. So you can honestly see how precious the existence of I try to never sacrifice my ability as an artist to the context 
or to the theme. So now, no matter how small or large it is, I still think it should be drop dead, oh my God, artwork. <laughs> There's another series I did called The Day After Rape, and it's about women. You might have heard this on the radio. Women who are fought are wars. You know, women are not fighting a lot of times. They're taking care of their children, and they're taking care of their property. When they can no longer take care of their property, they go to these immigrant uh, groups, and they are all there with these babies. And they have to go out and get wood and water, and, and they're attacked on their way home or on the way there. And I wanted you to know that they're not only Africans. They're everywhere. So the piece on the left is called The Devil Made Me Do It. That's the guy who, who did heinous things to women. On the piece on the right is Day After Raid Bosnia. Next. These come from that series, but the sub-series is Day After Raid Darfur. And they're very small. Next. The piece on the right is the very first piece in the series, something you can hold in your hand and realize some orifice, her vagina or anus, it's bleeding and she's bound. How did she get that way? One of my aunt godchildren, and I say that because we're so close now, but they're still so young, they would be my godchildren. And we're all artists. Grandfather passed away and he said, come to the house, you know I'm selling things. And I found a box of Meerschaum pipe that looked like the thigh of a, of a brown person with black socks on, and I made them the legs to this piece. She's a water bearer, the top of her body is a jar. Why am I using pipes? Not just because they look like legs, because they, men generally, women smoke, but men generally place them in their mouths to gain pleasure. And there, in this rape, is some kind of psychosexual weirdness. And that, the pipe makes me think of that next. Gather of wood, a pregnant woman from that. You know, many times women would become pregnant after a rape and then their families and communities would discard them. Next. Okay, folks. I have another series called Still Funny. I know one day, and it might be closer than we think, it might take us eight years, get it, to get there. <laughs> but there will be a day when we'll be able to do what we do in our own kitchens now, kitchens now together. You know what you say in the kitchen when you had a hard day about somebody else. You know how you talk about other people. I know you're there like, you're in the house of God and I cannot lie. But I am a saint and I never say anything about black people, Hispanic people, white people, and it's not true. Some of that stuff is really funny too. And there'll be one day when we can get together and think about how the past has changed us and the silly stuff we did. So this series, still funny, is overtly doing those jokes and they're meant to be off-putting. The first piece I did in the series was this mammy. That's a current piece you can buy in Charlotte, South Carolina. I'm sorry, Charleston, South Carolina. And she was holding a rolling pin, but the color of it and the shape didn't look like that to me. So I changed it to a white pin. Now the guy was playing a flute, but he's not nice. <laughs> and let me tell you how deep I think this really is. These pieces are not made in America. They're made in Asia. They're stereotypical pieces about blacks and Europeans made by Asians. So everybody's in on this. Next. Once again, sometimes I just make things because I love to luxuriate in beauty. The piece on the left is actually the size you see it. It's a very, really large, big plastic kind of shade or room divider, but I'm not finished with it. The piece on the right is a little smaller than you see it. And it's all small glass beads, and I've decided it's not finished, so I'm going to make it giant. But I did it just because I love to bead. And I wanted to tell a story, as you said earlier. 
Next. This is one of the pieces that's going to be in the Harry Tubman and Other Truths. It's 45 inches long. It's not much smaller than what you see now. And it's not finished. And it's a veil that's kind of telling the story of that large brown face. All very small beings. Because one of the things that I know about myself, and I said my ego laid earlier, was about the prowess that I have in creating beadwork. And I'm not scared or ashamed to say that. In fact, I like to flaunt it. Yes. This is from another series called Ancestry Progeny. Your grandparents couldn't choose you, and you couldn't choose them. So get over it. Some of the things that are our greatest strengths come from someone who's not the same ethnic group as you present to be. So this, she's a small girl, small sculpture around this big. And her arms or legs and things that maybe financially or, or academically supported her are her white ancestors. Next. The piece on the left I just wanted to do. And the piece on the right was in the prospect to uh, Biennale in New Orleans, maybe, I think, in 2012. And it's an Nkisi. Does anybody here know what an Nkisi is? I can't believe that. OK. An Nkisi is generally a sculpture. You may see it with nails or mirrors or other parts. I see it as not only a, a divination, but it's a thing you go to to ask for power, for forgiveness. You've seen them many times. A great example in the Western world is a statue in a church, where you go to it for prayer and you ask it for things. You might leave a prayer card there or some kind of donation. Same thing. Is that the fire department? And am I so hot that I am so and it's a sister, right? <laughs> yeah, girlfriend. <laughs> I love this piece because I made it in, in New Orleans, basically, and the materials are blown glass and other tchotchkes that I had in an African sculpture, and those green glass pieces are fingers, penises, and eyes. So think about being in a studio with both mostly men, and you're like, oh, I want you to make a penis, and a what? Next. That takes me directly to being in a studio with men. My gallery said to me, I think in around 2011, where do you want to be in a few years? And I said, because why shouldn't I say, I want to be in the Venus Biennale, the Venice Biennale. And uh, you know, I'm just talking. And they said, um. So I had two residencies in Murano, which is the glass island off the coast of Venice proper working with Venetian or Muranese glass blowers. Now this is a very, very old tradition. In fact, the beads that many natives used hundreds of years ago were provided by the glass makers in Murano. It is a style of work that they believe should be done by men, this glass blowing. And you know they've never seen a fat, gappy tooth, curly haired African American woman who probably had on wearing velvets and things. Most people that they invite are artists of other disciplines who don't know very much about glass. But I've had years of glass knowledge. The first year was a little bumpy. One reason is because my interpreter was sick the first day and I didn't have anyone for two weeks except the guy who owned it, but he wasn't every day, and people who were sure they were speaking English. <laughs> and I know I was speaking not Italian, but Italian. <laughs> we got very good things that happened. There's one thing, and you'll see examples of it in the installation, the hanging, the lynch tree. I tried to do, to fuse glass with my beadwork in the same way I did in the States and it was really chemically incompatible. So during my last, between the first and second year, I found antique 
Italian beads that were com chemically compatible. And this time, instead of hearing, ma che si fa? No, no, no. I heard this. <laughs> These two pieces are from the first year. They're called Milk Mammy 1, that's on the right, and Milk Mammy 2. Milk Mammy 2 is in the mute, it says at 108. And the dress culminates in women. So if you look, there are figures at the bottom. This is something I also made at home. I don't always know why I make pieces. This one is called Shh. I just knew that there were these big African sculptures that I really wanted to integrate in the work. And the thing to show young artists is that that dress started as my, you just making a, a orange dress with beads, but the drawing in it comes from the different color yarns I use. And that's uh, three feet tall. Next. This is the sister to that. That's also three feet tall. And so the really subtle colors you see are from the yarn. Yes. Back to Moran, second year. So I took these beaded faces that I made of Buddha and we fused them to the glass. So that white face is my beadwork that they are gathering up into the bubble on the, on the blowpipe. The first thing they said was, a oh, Buddha, why? And I said, what you trying to say? <laughs> why not? I live in a global community. I can do what I want. We are paying you guys. Go to make me a Buddha. I made the four aspects like the four seasons, the four corners of the world, you know, hot, cold, wet, all of that. And this one, I believe, is winter and the cold wind. So that uh, detail on the right is my beadwork holding a person, a wind person. Next. This one is summer. Heat. This one is owned by the African American Museum in Washington, D.C. It's not out yet, but they bought it. This is a, see that hand holding this burning woman and that she should look like that? It's a big jump for me, guys. And that's because I had the ability to go to Italy outside of my comfort zone at home and work with people who were laughing at me. They, that, that's not true. Who just were not exactly sure what I was about. So I'm sure in my, inside myself I had to prove something to them so I could say, bam, get it. Now what you got? And the face on this one is also my beaver fused. This is winter. This is a very tall piece. And it's uh, the figure, the small figure, is made out of earth. You see that figure on the leg, the face? I said, would you get me some permanent markers? And I started drawing on it. This is not what they do. So they're looking at me like, and well, now she's drawing on it. I can't even leave a minute. <laughs> Next. You can see on the right that that's a big Buddha face with different colors of red and orange that made that. And the back, that gold leaf face is disappearing. That's what I wanted to do through use. Let's move a little faster. We'd be here forever. OK. I know we're in a church, but we're talking about my work. I'm starting a series called Lewd. Go ahead, cry, yell at me. It's lewd because I have lewd thoughts too. And this figure kept creeping on me when I was in Italy. So I said, OK, let's make it. She had no face, and I, I kept having these visions that her face were, her face came from the emissions from this man. Now, I'm sure that that's not even so different for many people if you think about all the dark things that we see. This piece was a big 
step for me because when I looked at this man, I wanted him to have ribs, but I didn't want to take forever to make the ribs. So I had to force myself to learn how to make his ribs and body simultaneously. And that's another whole kind of mad scientist jump with bead work. It's a very large piece. And remember, I'm in the studio with men and I'm asking them about, I'm asking them to make pieces about childbirth for me. So they're like, you want us to do what? You're, she's pulling it from her. She's, what's going on in the back? Just do it! It was, right now, only two, I think, in this series called War Women. So I cast this glass at Wheaton in New Jersey, which is a glass place that the, the dice talk about just, you know, how fickle life is. She's carrying a heart on her back, a glass heart like a backpack that's inflamed. Uh, and she's a woman because there are also women fighters. War women too. The heads that she's standing on are the guys who got her into this. Next. This is one of the strongest pieces and one of the pieces that I feel is just another step for me. While I was there, they said to me, do you know what totems are, totem poles? And I said, I'm from America, yeah? Of course I know what a totem pole is. He said, how about you, I'll let you have the studio, you can make some totem poles. And then he proceeded to show me the ugliest totem poles in the glass books. And I said, okay. So I went to my assistant, this was the second year. And the assistant was only someone who helped me with, now, with, my, with my language and who would look stuff up. I said, I want you to look up a lot of rifles and guns because we're gonna make a totem pole on the sex trade, but it's going to be a musket. And this piece is over five feet tall and it's about people who many times are forced to give their kids up into the sex trade. Firstly, they may think that she's going into the city or he to work in a restaurant or in a school, Rom. You may have 14 children and you can easily feed 12. Sometimes two have to go. That whole rifle is glass. Next. This is the piece that's the installation, the first time you're probably seeing it, Jen. Um, it's probably the first time you've ever seen it like that. So the, it, completely different stance at the show. Uh, this is Lynch Tree. This woman was initially in New Orleans in a tree. <laughs> and I don't know why she's lynching a tree. I think somehow it's a play on power and lynching. The lynch, the, the branches are made of glass. Next. The first installation I did of real size was in Charleston, South Carolina during this Spoleto Music Festival. I kept seeing this place that I liked and it was the, the carcass of their old museum. So I called the Black History Society and said, oh, tell me about this, I'd like to use this. And they said, why do you want to do that there? They never let black people in there before. And I said, well, that's why I'm going to use it. And when they said, huh? I said, well, yeah, now I know I'm going to use it. So this piece, because there's like was vandalism, I told the neighborhood that it was about um, transformation, but it's really a venture. And my mom helped me make it. It's around 17 feet tall. The bottom part are, are painted logs that were lit at night that looked like an opera uh, screen. But I, I mean, I, I couldn't do it, get a photograph of it because it was vandalized before I could get it, a good photograph of it. I have a mosaic medallion at the National uh, Airport in Washington, D.C. And I tell everybody, go see it. It'll be the only time you can walk on me. <laughs> the retrospective I told you about at the Baltimore Museum of Art allowed me to use the thinker. Now, when I was a child and the front doors were open, he used to sit outside. This is long before they understood weather. 
and what it did to artwork. And I did everything that all the kids did. I'd jump on that, the first genitalia we would play. So by the time I was having this retrospective, he was on the inside and I said, I want to use him in one of my installations. And they laughed at me like they did in Italy. <laughs> no. And I said, why not? So Dan is dead. <laughs> and they said, you know, it's our responsibility to be caretakers for this piece. You must find a context for us to use it. I remember that I worked in Philadelphia, and there were these big Rodan doors, and at the top was a very small thinker. It's at the Philadelphia Academy. I and a curator sat together, and we found this, and then when I went back to him, I said, hey, there's a context for it in contemporary life, and it's surrounded by people in hell, and so I want to use it. Above him is a small boy who's been lynched, and he's so saturated with the mean things people say about race that they have popped out of his body. So there with his bones are watermelon, and there are words written on him, like niggas fit kite, yeah. I'm installing this while the museum is open. Adults with their children and teachers with their children have no idea what I'm talking about. Before I can explain it, the kids say everything. Elementary school, junior high school kids know everything. Next, we're almost done for. I was also asked to do another installation, and they, when we were discussing things, they kept talking about these trees in the neighborhood. We don't like the way they look. They come in and they grow out and move over everything. We don't like the way they smell. I said, that, that sounds familiar to you. So when you cut those down, save some for me. I had a bunch of really good friends, tricked them up, covered them with beads, and replanted them. Because it's, you have the right just to be who you are. Next. I am a printmaker, I can finally say that. Remember when I was, when I told you that I was told to stop painting for the betterment of myself, the whole human race? <laughs> well, I'm not a good painter. My closest way of painting is as a printmaker because I'm looking at paintings and there's some really crappy paintings out there that are selling for a lot of money. And I'm a crappy painter. So I thought, I should get back into the industry. <laughs> This series is called Sexecution. Someone had opened a sex magazine, it wasn't me, at checkout at like the Safeway, and there was this beautiful black woman on the cover. So of course I read through it. She's part Haitian, part Ethiopian. She's just like amazing. So I'm an old feminist, I'm reading through, I'm hoping she's going to say, and I'm going to use this money, I'm opening up a business. My, she said, I don't want to get pregnant. So I thought about my ability to know about this woman's life while I'm in the Safeway, and she's naked. So I used her image in this series called Sex Execution. The table that she's on is the table that they kill people in in prison. And that window that those eyes are coming from is the window that people watch. We are such voyeurs now that our eyes and our nose and our ears and our lips all have eyes connected to us. We're so hungry to see. Before Obama became president, I did a series of prints about him. And I did him kind of combined with St. Martin of the Pores, St. Martin de Pores. He is the patron saint of criadas of maids, of the sick, and of animals. You see him with a broom, animals, and, and a, you know, a hospital room. And there's like a, a veve or a, a Mexican kind of charm, and then there's Obama. Well, one of my art godsons called me from San Francisco and said, Joyce, I'm buying you a votive candle. They've taken St. Martin and they've covered his face with Obama. 
He said, I have to give this to you because the Catholic Church is so angry they're taking them all off the market because Obama is not a saint. And then I went online and looked at it and thought, wow, now that's some power, guys. And that also talks about the wants and the desires of certain people. Next. But I love Obama, and they kept talking about how big his ears were. You know, he's not a, he's not a saint, he's a guy. So I made him on the left with the Yoda's ears and the right Mickey Mouse ears. Next. Buddha. Now, if you haven't figured it out yet, I've been a performer for years. When people ask me when, when did you become an artist? When did you become a performer? I always say in vitro. I came out with the best looking placenta ever. <laughs> I came out, I said to the doctor, move, you're in my life. You guys old enough to know these kind of any young, you, know, you don't know these jokes, any young men? Any of them? I went back in twice because I didn't like the first two takes. But boom, boom, wake up. Okay. So for years I performed. The image on the left is of me and Kayla Wall. We were called the Thunder Thigh Review. We traveled all around the United States, Scotland, Holland, and Canada, doing comedy dramedy about social, about the society, the world society. We were called the Thunder Thigh Review because we were very shapely. Unfortunately now, my thighs have the same pattern from cellulite that you see up there. <laughs> oh, you guys laugh at that one. I performed with others too. The, the piece on the right is of me performing with a group called Honey Child Milk. It's actually a coon show. So, once again, one day it'll be funny. And we would catch people, as a friend of mine says from New, from New York, unawares. <laughs> it was also a musical, and I was the mom. And as my daughter was leaving, I'd say to her, I hope I live to see you again. And the audience invariably went, Did you see something? <laughs> Am I allowed to laugh? <laughs> there was another character in this show that has followed me in every, every show that I've written after. Because after this, I, I became a one person, monologist, performer, because that's where the real risk is. Remember Rodney Dangerfield? Yes. I don't get no respect. Rodney Dangerfield in the field is the Stand that slave comic. And his yoke was his tie. And he's like, I don't get no repair. I don't get no repair. I'm going down to the fields to tell a couple of jokes because I've got me a captive audience. <laughs> right? And he was that kind of comic. And a lot, of, a lot of the work got stranger and stranger. He became James Brown. He said some things that weren't good to the master, and he hit me once, ow! He hit me twice, ow, ow! He, take, he hit me three times, ow, ow! Take me to the bridge, y'all, and I'd be dancing, and he hung me from it. Mixing that kind of comedy together. Next. One person worked, the last one person show I did was called Walk a Mile in My Drawers. That's a lot of walking. <laughs> and Rodney and Dangerous in the Field was in this show again, and he was there with, um, who is Jefferson's, Jefferson's a paramour, the African woman who, what's her name? Sally Emmons, thank you. <laughs> so there's a whole contretemps between uh, Rodney and between Sally Hemings when she just came back from France. And she's talking to him like this. Oh, it's just crazy. I still do performance. The piece on the left is me with my uh, musical partner, Lorraine Whittlesey. We're called Ebony and Irony. You choose which is which. <laughs> and 
many times I'll work with younger performers. This is, I'm working with a spoken word person and we're doing improvisational work. But the truth is my mom, Elizabeth Caldwell Scott, she and my father, to a different degree, not lesser, but different, taught me that this is probably the one life I got. I better live it. My parents both had very bright lights. But because of their ethnicity and their lack of education and they were growing up in the South, they were told to hide it under a bushel. Remember, if you leave the country folks, you have to hide that stuff under a bushel. But my mom said I should never. My parents ate crap so that I could have sugar. So I'm not hiding this under a basket. I'm going to shine. And if you cannot cop a hit off this plane, if you can't see that in me and see in yourself your great joy and ability, then step off. Because I am going to blow. <laughs> nobody's fault but my own. It's nobody's fault but my own. If I die and my soul gets lost, it's nobody's fault but my own. I know a preacher he can preach. Eli is his preacher. Lord, he could preach, but when he died, oh, his soul got lost. It's nobody's fault but his own. It's nobody's fault but my own. It's nobody's fault but my own. If I die and my soul gets lost, oh, if I die and my soul gets lost, if you die and your soul gets lost, nobody's fault but my own.